Okay, um, we, we, we'll come to order. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody for, for coming out. Um, it's a, a very wet evening and the effort is appreciated. Um, the numbers are small, but I'm sure the quality is very high. Um, the topic of the paper this evening is uh, the life program and opportunity for the water sector. It's a, a joint presentation by uh, the Republic of Ireland branch of the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management and uh, the Environment and Water Section of Engineers Ireland. <coughs> My name is, is Liam Clear. I'm the current branch chairman of the Republic of Ireland branch of SIWEM. Uh, Owen Cullinan is here on behalf of, of Engineers Ireland in his role as uh, the chairman of the Water and Environment Section. Um, the paper is going to be jointly presented by uh, Jean from the Environmental Inspectorate of the Department of, Community, of Environment, Community uh, and Local Government and she will be followed by Rory O'Crohor, um, who is the project manager for the Bulk Hair Life Project. Um, very quickly, Jean um, has more than 30 years' experience um, in environmental work, um, both in the public and, and private sector. She's a chartered uh, water and environmental manager, and uh, she's currently with the DECLG, as I said. Um, Rory then has more than 20 years' experience in the management of conservation. Um, and in the land reform area, both in Ireland and uh, in Africa. Um, uh, the uh, subject of the paper um, is uh, the LIFE programme, as we've said. Jean is going to talk about that programme itself, and Rory then is, is going to follow up with the sort of practical application of um, the uh, programme to a, a project, the Mulcair uh, River System. So I've said enough. It's over to, to Jean. Thanks, and uh, good evening to everyone. I'll probably go through my one fairly quickly <laughs> because it's probably not the most exciting presentation, and the more interesting bit is probably the example of the uh, project. Um, just to say, because of the SIWAM audience, uh, I sort of targeted this towards the water sector, but. Uh, it's important to note that the LIFE programme isn't just for water projects, it's basically the EU programme for environmental projects, as you'll find out <coughs> as we start um, going through the, um, the programme. So uh, basically, it's based on a it has a legislative base um, in the EU legislation, so there's actually a regulation called the LIFE regulation. It's Regulation 1293 of 2013, and it replaced an earlier regulation which was called a Life Plus regulation. So, this new regulation has made some changes to the program, and it's a seven year program, so it runs from 2014 to 2020. And as you can see there, it's basically to um, provide funding for environmental projects that are related to um, <coughs> EU environmental policy, I suppose, in particular highlighting there the seventh environmental action program, which would be the main EU um, program that sets out uh, all of the sort of environmental program for the Commission for the next um, seven years. Um, in terms of the new programme, what's different about this one is that it created a new sub-programme. So there's a sub-programme for climate action and there's a sub-programme for the environment. Now tonight I'm just going to focus on the sub-programme for the environment um, because that would be the one that's probably most appropriate. But I suppose, as I said a moment ago, um, and you'll see in a minute, because the programme covers quite a wide range of topics, um, the overall mechanics of the programme and how you might apply for funding are the same regardless of what sector you're trying to um, get the money for. Um, and as you can see there in the um, <coughs> new programme, uh, the budget for the seven years is approximately 3.5 billion euro and that's divided between 2.6 roughly for the environment programme and 800 odd thousand going to the uh, climate sub-programme. 
And of that money, um, at least 81% of the budget will actually go into real projects, so that's roughly 2.8 billion. Um, there are different types of projects involved, but really the only one that's of relevance to anybody here who might be thinking of a project is the traditional projects, which are the projects that have been run all along, and the project that you'll be hearing about afterwards from Rory would be a good example of a traditional project. So basically, they're projects that uh, sort of showcase best practice innovation and demonstration as well as dissemination of information <coughs> um, because there's a separate strand that relates to um, information and governments. The um, integrated projects are actually a new project type that have only come out in the new LIFE program, the current LIFE regulation from 2013. And they're really only appropriate uh, to government bodies because basically they're large-scale projects that uh, the Commission is sort of going to provide part funding to implement plans or programs. So essentially that would be about <coughs> implementing, uh, well, facilitating, if you like, the implementation of, say, a river basin management plan as part of the Water Framework Directive, or it might be facilitating a regional waste management plan, or on the nature side it would actually be facilitating the um, path, what's of the priority action framework, which sets out what the uh, nature program is uh, for each country. So it would actually be to facilitate that. The technical assistance grants, again, wouldn't be applicable to anyone here. They're basically money that's been made available by the Commission to prepare for an integrated project, because the integrated projects are huge projects where the Commission would be looking at possibly putting about 10 million towards a project, so it requires a reasonable amount of work to be able to get the project together. And the capacity building projects are really for um, accession states who have got to get up to the level that the, um, the other member states are at. So, just really to say it's traditional projects we're looking at after all of that. <laughs> That's uh, basically just a graphic representation showing the overall budget. Um, I don't have a pointer, so sorry, you can see there 75% of the budget goes to the environment sub-program. And well, not unfortunately, but for those of us who aren't involved in nature, 55% of that actually goes to nature projects, so you're down to 45% going to non-nature projects, and then 25% of the budget <coughs> will be going to the uh, climate projects. And I suppose there's also possibilities for water or more broad environmental projects also under the Climate Action Programme. Um, national allocations have sort of been a, a component of life, I suppose, all along. Um, but in recent, recently, and with the adoption of this regulation, they're ultimately trying to phase it out. But for the first part of the programme, there is an indicative national allocation. So for Ireland, it's, uh, as you can see, roughly about 11.5 million over the four-year period, so that works out at about 2.8 million a year would be available uh, potentially for a few life um, projects. Um, and then for the second period of this program, the last three years of it, the national allocations will be phased out and they're trying to move more towards a merit-based approach. But having said that, even where there is a national allocation, it still means that the project has to meet a certain standard before it has any chance of um, being selected. Um, and then on the climate sub-programme, the projects are going to be based on merit only. <coughs> So on the sub-program for the environment, it's sort of divided into those three broad areas, environment and resource efficiency, nature and biodiversity, which as I say gets 55% of the budget, and then environmental governance and information. 
that's just another graphic really showing that sort of talking about the regulation where you have the three broad areas. Then there's sort of broad thematic areas that I'll go through in a minute. And then there's actually a work program that was adopted by the Life Committee. So in other words, it had to be agreed by the member states. So they had some input into the program that would have been prepared um, by the Commission. Um, so you can see there, that's the sort of um, the different areas that are involved in the sub-program for the environment. So you have nature and biodiversity, you have water, <coughs> which is the focus here, you have waste, uh, resource efficiency, environment and health, air quality and emissions, and information and governments, which also can have possibilities for projects in any of those particular um, areas. So um, focusing on the traditional projects, I suppose they generally tend to be SMEs, NGOs, sort of public administrations who get involved in these projects. And I suppose in the new program, the Commission would very much favour having some private sector involvement, but I suppose generally it wouldn't have been huge uh, now on the LIFE program, although we do have a project at the moment here in Ireland, which has been run by a waste management company in association with UCC, and I think it's the University of Thessalonica in Greece. Um, so, as you saw, it relates to those six priority um, areas, and uh, in particular, in the new program, that's what's really different. There's a multi-annual work program, which um, at the moment is for those three years, 2014 to 2017, it lists a large number of project topic areas. Now, they're fairly broad, but essentially the key is that you need to pick something that falls within those to project topic areas. And they're quite, I suppose, large enough projects. They tend to be anything from about 500 to 1.5 million provided by the Commission and seen as the, uh, in the first area of the project, uh, they will provide 60% and then the other 40% <coughs> has to be provided <coughs> by um, the um, main beneficiary to the project. So one of the difficulties, uh, unfortunately, is coming up with the other 40%, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily have to be hard cash. That can be you know, in kind and in terms of staff working on the project, etc. But the key is trying to get somebody who's willing to put up that part of the uh, funding. Now, I'll just kind of skim through these really, except for this first one maybe, because you can read this afterwards yourself. <coughs> we can move on in a few minutes to Rory to the more interesting part. but. Essentially, as I said there, it um, relates to the specific objections for water set out. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the road wrap for a resource efficient Europe. It was brought out, I think, in 2012 as part of the Europe 2020 strategy, which has a number of strands to it, and one of those strands is resource efficiency. And then, as I said, the seventh environmental action program, which is essentially maps out the Commission um, objectives for the environment. So particularly it's looking at integrated approach, approaches for the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, um, activities for the implementation of, that's the Floods Directive 2070-60 EC, and then also activities for the implementation of program measures for the, that other directive there is the Marine Strategy framework, and then activities to ensure safe and efficient use of water resources, improving quantitative water management, preserving a high level of water quality, and avoiding the misuse and deterioration of water resources. <coughs> so um, these ones are basically related um, to the floods directive. So as I said, I'll just skim through the broad areas and you can sort of read them yourself. If anyone wants to get the detailed work program, 
uh, we can make it available to anybody afterwards, particularly if you're interested <coughs> in the projects that fall outside of the water sector, because all the um, project topics are listed there. So that's continuation of the water floods and drought, um, still on water floods and drought. Then we have marine and coastal management. I mean, the marine strategy framework is something that in the department we're sort of just preparing for the implementation <coughs> of that one at the moment. Um, and one of those areas that's a very hot topic at the moment would be the marine litter, particularly um, microplastics and microplastic beads that are used a lot in cosmetic products is a sort of a big issue at the moment. And also um, in a, a new amendment to the packaging directive, there's a, a particular amendment related to plastic bags, <coughs> which is looking at um, having European-wide um, action on plastic bags. I suppose we were the leaders there, and a particular focus of that is also actually marine litter. <coughs> um, there you have synergies between coastal management and spatial planning. We actually had a project that went in this year that relates to that particular area. Then there's the water industry. If there's, I know there's a few Irish water people here. <coughs> um, technologies for drinking water and urban wastewater treatment uh, systems. Mm -hmm. um, also on the water industry in relation to recycled and reclaimed um, water. Um, and uh, this is the topic area of the environmental governance and information, which also has areas related to water. So we'll be, these are mainly awareness uh, raising projects. They tend to be a little bit harder to get in terms of success rate. So. In some ways, you might be more advised uh, to go under the environment sub-program, but maybe if you had a particularly good project that fits better under here, um, it's also worth having, you know, looking at that particular area. Uh, this might be an interesting one. <laughs> projects to develop and test water <laughs> pricing policies. <laughs> Um, based on innovative approaches. <coughs> we might need some of those innovative approaches. Um, and then we've got, again, the marine strategy um, framework. Um, so as I said there, this is the important bit, that the co-financing rate, when you're in a traditional project uh, for this three-year um, multi-annual work program is still at 60%, so the Commission will give 60%. Now, if you're on a nature project and you're specifically targeting priority species and habitats, there's actually up to 75% available. And then in the next phase of the program, the co-financing is going back to uh, 55%. Um, I already mentioned that the multi-annual work program, and as I say, that's for this 2014-2017 period, and then around 2017 they'll prepare a new program to take through to for the last uh, three years of the um, program. And I think I sort of already said this, so I'll skip that one. That's again just talking about the um, resources that go towards, the, well, the actual amount that goes towards the real projects, um, the 55% going to the nature and biodiversity. And it's not really relevant here, but there's a 30% ceiling to be dedicated to the integrated projects. And um, the department uh, is the national uh, contact point, and uh, basically we're trying to work more with potential applicants at the moment and take opportunities such as this to sort of raise awareness of the program and to help people who are seriously um, considering an application. And we've sort of developed um, a concept note sort of template which we 
used last year and we'll probably do a few revisions to it this year and uh, basically it's so that we can get an idea of who might be seriously considering a project and also uh, steering them towards looking towards the co-financing and you know trying to get all their ducks in a row well before the actual uh, call comes out um, mm -hmm. And we're also planning to have an application writing workshop, again really focusing on the people who are seriously planning to put in an application just because we can't have too many people. <coughs> um, and really we can't stress enough uh, the importance of having a good enough lead-in time for the projects and Rory will probably be able to tell you a bit more about that because he's been involved in a few of them. Um, it is a complicated enough application form, there's no point saying that it isn't, but then on the other hand it's a lot of money that you can potentially get and you know you can't give that kind of money away lightly so you know they need to know enough about the uh, project and whatever and I suppose while we do have an addictive national allocation, you are still basically competing with other member states who all have good projects as well, looking for the money. And um, normally, well, this year they're saying the call will be hopefully in Q2, so it'll probably be around May, we would suspect. And then there's four months after the call to actually fill out the application. But I can't stress enough that if you're only starting to think about it then, you're probably going to be too late um, because it probably isn't enough time to be able to get the money and that together. And these are um, the actual colleagues of mine who are the national contacts points and Siobhan is here with me <laughs> and uh, she can help if you have any tricky questions, particularly the tricky ones I'll pass on to Siobhan. So I'll now... <laughs> pass over to Rory to give you a flavour of a real project. I'm not Do I? Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah, there's where you can get the actual documentation and um, if you're interested, and as I say, if you want us to send you the, prog or the, uh, w the actual project topics, we can do that, although they're probably all there in those links. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'd like to uh, thank both Engineers Ireland and uh, the Chartered Institute for the opportunity to present uh, today and to Jean and the our colleagues in the department. Um, what my plan was, that's if this um, machine is going to work for me. Yes, um, my plan was just to talk very briefly about some of the success stories of the LIFE pro programme, give some background to the Mulcair LIFE project itself, uh, talk about how we've gone about doing our work in terms of engaging uh, local stakeholders, and then... Uh ...of the... Karen Tuchel, which of course has nothing to do with um, the LIFE programme, but has a very big deal to do with um, mountaineering Ireland. Um, they weren't involved in the reinstatement, nor were they involved in the cutting down of the cross, but uh, they did get awarded the environmental award by the Chartered Institute um, two weeks ago. So, um, LIFE programme in Ireland is celebrating 22 years. Um, this is the LIFE website. Uh, it's well worth a visit. It's a fantastic resource. Um, but in, in, on the 20th anniversary, which was two years ago, the, the investment in LIFE projects was about 100 million. Uh, so very significant uh, uh, investment by the Commission. Uh, 50 projects, some of them uh, including our own, uh, which I'm going to talk about, uh, related specifically to river restoration. Others related to control of invasives, like the Casey project on Loch Carb. Uh, one that I was involved in myself, and I'm still sort of involved on the fringes, uh, was the Burren Life Project, which gave birth to um, the Burren uh, Farming for Conservation Program, which has expanded from a 20 pilot farm, a uh, 20 uh, pilot initiative with 20 farmers in the Burren to uh, some 160, 170 today, and expanding the whole time. Uh, a great success, perhaps the greatest success story of all life projects. Um, 
Croatia have been a very big uh, component, uh, um, a very big party to the life program, and they've had quite a number of successful uh, life projects: the restoration of raised bogs, restoration of native woodlands. The Golden Eagle Trust uh, had a very successful life uh, project up in uh, up in Donegal, the reintroduction of the Golden Eagle. As I said, Quilch have had a, a, a number of very successful uh, uh, projects uh, right throughout. There's another uh, current life project uh, in Duhallow, IRD Duhallow, Fran Igo. Uh, it's on the conservation of freshwater pearl mussel. And indeed, there's another life project uh, just starting on the um, freshwater pearl mussel. Uh, at the time of the celebration of the 20th uh, anniversary, there was a, there was a comment um, that life is more than a fund, it is a philosophy that connects people and nature. The impossible becomes possible. And I think that sums up, uh, especially in an Irish context, um, really in an Irish context, uh, in terms of EU funding, it's the only show in town. It's the most significant, as you saw from Jean's, it's a very, very significant budget. Um, and what is key in an Irish context is that we actually access our allocation and indeed access more than our allocation. So Mulcair Life, this is what the Mulcair looks like on an autumn day. Um, our project is a, is a five year project. It actually stretched to six years, uh, five years impl implementation, but uh, six years in total. We're finished in two weeks time. So we then enter the afterlife. Um, I'm looking forward to that part. Uh, it's 1.75 million, 50% funding from the Commission. The key uh, coordinating beneficiaries Inland Fisheries Ireland, uh, with associated beneficiaries in the Office of Public Works and Limerick County Council. A range of co-financiers and project supporters, I'm not going to list them, but the very important uh, co-financier is the National Parks and Wildlife Service. This is the Shannon, uh, many of you are familiar with it. Um, there's always talk, of course, of Dublin trying to rob the Shannon's waters. I'm not going to get into that debate. Uh, this is the extent of the Shannon catchment. This is the extent of the lower Shannon. And this is the extent of the Mulcair catchment. Uh, quite a beautiful area. Um, the river. Um, the river the, the, if I can go backwards. Uh, let's see if I can just go backwards. Previous. Um, we have the Newport, the Dead, uh, the Bilbo, quite a number of rivers, but they've all been subjected to, um, to, to past drainage. But as I said, we work through a catchment management process. These, these are some of our, um, our, our project partners uh, on the ground. We have farmers, we have local anglers, we have the state agencies, the Office of Public Works, Limerick County Council, as I said. Uh, Limerick County Council are represented on, through a number of, of different ways. And then we have, of course, National Parks and Wildlife Service. I'm just looking at the faces, tourism interests, et cetera, et cetera, Chagish. But this is what we're addressing. We're addressing a history of drainage on the main stem of the Mulcair and on other, uh, other uh, tribs of the Mulcair. So a, a history that dates back, you'll love this uh, image. Uh, it dates back to 1874, the Mulcair River drainage district and you'll, you'll all have heard of the very famous engineer, uh, Barrington uh, uh, in Limerick, uh, but they were the engineers involved. And very large stretches of the Mulcair, uh, the Newport, and indeed the Bilbo were drained. You can see from this uh, image uh, quite clearly the drainage. You can see the old oxbows. You can see how the river actually ran and how it runs now. And this is the type, these, uh, two more oxbows there. This is the type of, of canalization that occurred. This is more recent history, so this is in late 1990s. Uh, this is the types of work that were done on the, on the, on the uh, Newport River. This is the type of river then that we're left with. Straight, canalized, low gradient, uh, devoid of, of riparian habitat, and indeed, uh, to, to, to a large extent, devoid of in-stream habitat. Um, this is the extent of some of the works on the Newport Anna River. Um, you can see <laughs> just the extent of, this is of course before best practice came uh, into play, but you can see the extent of the works and the types of works that were being undertaken uh, on the Newport. So a lot of the uh, traditional spawning habitats, a lot of the excellent in-stream habitats taken out, uh, and basically what we are trying to address and what we have tried to address is to look at the drain sections and see if we can improve them in terms of the habitat for sea lamprey, for salmon, and indeed for otter. Our work with, with uh, salmon has essentially focused on the installation of rubble mats. And these rubble mats essentially provide habitat for, for, for juvenile salmon. Um, we're not saying we're going to um, 
do the whole river, but we look at prioritized uh, areas. So I'm going to give you an example. This is, this, it, I, I'll explain what they are. This is pre-installation of a rubble mat. And the rubble mat essentially goes down the width of the river and the length of the river. It's uh, the installation of rock. I show, this is, as I said, pre, this is it post. So you can see the riffle sequence uh, created there. And this is how we go about uh, um, constructing these rubble mats. Placing rock on the bed of the river, as I said, the width and, and an equal length, uh, and then trying to have the top layer as a sort of interlocking cobble uh, rock. Uh, you can see the top layer uh, uh, quite clearly on that one. So what happens? Within weeks, you have macroinvertebrates uh, colonizing these rocks, and they provide excellent uh, habitat then for juvenile salmon. This is the type of habitat that, that is created from these rubble mats, and these are, these are the rubble mats uh, being deployed. So essentially, we're adding complexity to the river. We're, we're re-engineering the river, if you like. Um, uh, but um, wh what impact has it had? Um, what we have in terms of our electrofishing, we electrofish uh, the catchment every year, and what we've had is a threefold increase in, in salmon power on those sites, and that's important to mention. And the hope is that with increased numbers in the upper catchment, they, they're moving down as juvenile, juvenile uh, salmon power onto these sites, the habitat is there for them, then we'll, in, in the life cycle of the salmon we see increases. So that was the main stem of the Mulcair. We've, we've installed um, 28 rubble mats. Any one rubble mat could take up to 250, 300 tonne of rock. So they're not small undertakings, they're quite large. On the uh, main stem of the Newport, uh, on, the, on the Bilbo, we undertook other measures. A lot of stone vortex weirs, ordinary, uh, 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 this is a weir being installed at Ballymacchio Bridge. You can see it's under, it's under, under, under a bridge plate, and we're just installing it here, putting in, essentially uh, creating, uh, this is another stone weir on the, on the Mulcair itself, a stone vortex weir, and again, creating habitat uh, creating pool, uh, a pool sequence. But the biggest in-stream measure that we deployed was the placement of random boulders, uh, one to three ton random boulders in the river. I hope you can see it there in that one. That's on the, on the, on the Newport. So these are random boulders, but they're strategically placed random boulders, if that makes sense to you. Uh, they provide habitat again, they break up the uniformity, they add complexity to the river. And what you see uh, quite clearly here is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're spraying sites for otters. The resting point, uh, are, 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 I suppose, resting points for dipper, uh, but they're also, most importantly, uh, a place where protection is afforded to trout and to salmon. So they move, move behind the rock, move out into the stream, looking for food, move back. So that's the idea with them. Probably our biggest uh, area of work has been with sea lamprey. Uh, this is, uh, these are sea lamprey. Um, quite a fascinating uh, species, but what we've been looking at is addressing sea lamprey passage. And the, the problem with passage is that sea lamprey, unlike salmon, unlike trout, are very weak swimmers. They're returning uh, from, 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 from sea, enter into the Shannon system, pass through Limerick City, the very first river that they, 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 they then have an opportunity to pass up onto is uh, the Mulcair. The Mulcair is not just of, of, of national importance, but it's, it's of EU importance in terms of its sea lamprey population. We have a, a large number of barriers on, on the, on the Mulcair system, on the Mulcair catchment, but it's the lower ones, if you can see them here, Anacotti uh, and Ballyclock Weir, they're the significant ones that we've tried to address. All the other ones are passable. Uh, so these are the barriers that we try to uh, address. Uh, Anacotti, the top, uh, the crump weir under the motorway, which, which had a pre-existing sea lamprey pass, so it wasn't really a major problem, and then the one above that, the crump weir. So there were historic problems for sea lamprey passage at these points, and this is what, they were, this is what you were looking at. This is what sea lamprey were looking at in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, achieving passage. If they achieved passage, the entire catchment was open to them. So we went around uh, addressing this through, first of all, tagging them to see how are, how are they negotiating these barriers? We fitted radio tags to them, again, to see what their pattern of behavior was in terms of this. We lifted some above the barriers, we let some below, and we radio tracked them. We also used uh, the Air Corps very kindly, assisted us in the radio tracking. But basically, what 
we thought was the situation was the situation that they struggled to get above Anacotti, and if they did make it above Anacotti, they absolutely did not make it above Ballyclock, where we are about um, a kilometre up. So uh, we went about uh, addressing this through the creation or the, the design and development of a new sea lamprey pass. And it's essentially like uh, an egg box turned upside down. This is the actual plate, uh, the moulding plate. And uh, this was fitted onto this stainless steel um, uh, sheet. And ABS plastic sheets were moulded uh, and fitted onto this. And then uh, uh, assembled, as you see here, and fitted to the face of the weir of Anacotti. Um, we won't say anything about health and safety in any of these Im images here. Uh, but you can see it being fitted to Anacotti and on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, um, we are, uh, the image on the, on the left-hand side has been fitted to Ballyclock Weir. We then went about monitoring passage. And passage usually occurs at night. Uh, and uh, the only reason I'm showing you that is because zone C and zone G are the two zones on which the sea lamprey tiles were fitted. So we monitored each zone. We monitored from 4 in the morning till about 8 in the morning and from approximately 10 o'clock at night to about 2 in the morning. So that was the, that was the, the, the monitoring. The monitoring was a 15 minute walk over, over the weir to monitor every sea lamprey on every zone of the weir. This is what you'd be recording or this is what you'd be recording. So there is one, two, three, four, five, eight sea lamprey on that tile. This summer, on occasions, there'll be 30, there'll be 35, there'll be 40. This is what they can look like. I don't know if you can actually see the sea lamprey there, but that's all sea lamprey. Uh, that's what it is. This is one achieving passage, just passing over. Uh, and I do have a, a video, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to show it. Um, but there is a video on our website if you wish to if you wish to have a look. So, as I said, that's the monitoring, uh, uh, and, and it's triggered by temperature, it's triggered by flow velocity. Uh, this, is, this has been the situation we've monitored. But what we have found is that it's a very condensed migration period, very, very condensed. And what we have found is that for the last three years, including a hugely successful passage this year, 95% of all passage was achieved on the two tiles. So then, they had achieved passage at Anacotti. What about Ballyclock? So Ballyclock, this is what it looked like. Major barrier. There was a pre-existing breach, but a major, major barrier. This is what it looks like from the air. Um, massive barrier in moderate flow uh, in summer, probably ordinary summer flow, uh, ordinary summer flow again, extreme flood conditions. So not only was it a barrier in terms of sea lamprey passage, but it was also a barrier in terms of salmon passage. And not only was it a barrier for salmon, but it was also a point at which salmon were being illegally, or should I say, they were being taken without authorization. That's the word. Um, there was a pre-existing dysfunctional fish pass on it. You can see it here. Just didn't work. Our attempt at the sea lamprey pass, it didn't work simply because the, the substrate, what was underneath the, the breach, just was too crumbly. The rock was too crumbly. It didn't allow us. Uh, you can sort of see it there on the left-hand side. So our plan was to take out uh, a large section of the weir to uh, address scouring, to address illegal fishing activity, to address uh, major, major problems with the weir itself. And what we, what we, what we decided to do uh, after more than a year and a half of planning and consultation with various departments, various councils, OPW, etc., etc., and local landowners, obviously, we decided to install, rather than putting in a rock ramp, we decided to put in an elongated um, rubble mat, essentially. And this is how we went about the work. We took out uh, one whole section. We put in an access track, obviously, diverted the river. And you can, you can actually see the sea lamprey pass that was there for that season, for the 2013 season. We carefully removed that, and that's been utilized elsewhere. So it was a big job. Uh, it involved uh, reinforcement conservation work on the retained section. Um, this is the retained section uh, here, and this is the far, far wall. That's what it, it looks like now. So a, a very significant section was retained for, you know, it, it's for archaeological purpose, industrial heritage purposes. Uh, but yet we've achieved uh, passage. So that's what it looked like pre-construction. Uh, and thanks to the Air Corps this April, uh, this is what it looks like now. We've achieved 
at everything that we wanted to achieve at that point. So what, what difference has it made? It's opened up 184 kilometres of uh, lamprey uh, habitat and directly upstream uh, some lovely uh, uh, riffle and pool habitat. And also, very interestingly, kingfisher are here and above here where they never, they never were before. But probably the most significant element of all has been what it's meant for Sea Lamprey Passage. In 2012, we, 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 walked, we, we, we do walkover survey work every year for, for, to see how far the lamprey get up. So in 2012, we had 55 reds. And a red is essentially this. It's a, a spawning bed for sea lamprey. It might not be just used by one. It might be used by two or three. But in 2012, we had 55. In 2013, we had 85. This year, we've had 296. So a fourfold increase, and we're very, very happy with that. I'll quickly go on to talk about our work with otters. We do a lot of work with otters, um, installation of otter holes, artificial otter holes, uh, survey work. We do a lot of work on the removal of, uh, of uh, invasives, non-native invasives. The catchment, it's a big problem. Giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, and Himalayan bothel. Major, major problems in the catchment. So together with our project partners, we do a, a control program. Now, in the original application, uh, we said we were going to eradicate invasives. I think it's a bad word to use. I uh, wouldn't recommend it for anyone in any application. But we've gone about, together with, with local volunteers, we've done a lot of removal of Himalayan balsam. But our key partners on the ground have been local farmers. And the work we've done with local farmers is tr trying to address water quality concerns. Um, what we've essentially done is a lot of fencing, a lot of fencing, a lot of the installation of, of water trucks, some water harvesting, limited water harvesting to be true, uh, but we've, we've, um, we've fenced a very significant um, element of, of the dead, the risk, and the Mulcair and Bilbo rivers.